Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third day of the Low Carbon Design Institute Residency 2022. Um, I'm extremely pleased to welcome back Simone Ferracina, um, who is joining us um, uh, on, you know, by popular demand. Last year was extremely successful, extremely uh, enjoyed, and so a real pleasure to have you back. Uh, a little bit about Simone. Simone is the founding director of Exaptive Design Office, EDO, and a lecturer in architectural design detail at the Edinburgh School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at the University of Edinburgh. Um, his research and teaching interrogate alternative design potentials, technical platforms, and modes of architectural authorship with a focus on reuse and repurposing. He's the author of the monograph Ecologies of Inception, Design Potentials on a Warming Planet, and the director of OE Case Files, a series of books on experimental and transdisciplinary design research. He holds a diploma of architecture uh, and a PhD in philosophy, art, and critical thought. His work uh, independently and with the Experimental Architecture Group has been exhibited and published internationally. Thank you, Simone, for joining us, and I will stop sharing and hand over to you now. Excellent, thank you. So I, I will start sharing my screen. And okay, so now I should be in full screen mode, perfect. Excellent. So yes, so um, good good afternoon and um, many thanks to Alex for her invitation, for her introduction. It really is a pleasure to be back at the Low Carbon Design Institute for a second year um, and to meet a new cohort, a new cohort of, uh, I'm sure, uh, brilliant fellows. So today we'll be talking about a book that just came out with Routledge um, last week and is entitled Ecologies of Inception, Design Potentials on a Warming Planet. Rather than focusing on um, a single chapter, I will attempt a kind of transversal reading of the book, aiming to provide a summary and general flavor of its key arguments. And um, in order to do so, um, I will begin by introducing and explaining the title. So. So um, warming planet uh, clearly refers to uh, global warming and the climate emergency. As architects and designers, we're familiar by now with the IPCC reports and warnings and with the percentages indicating the vast contributions of the built environment to carbon emissions. And beyond numbers, we are increasingly aware of uh, the violence and injustices associated with and or perpetuated by, for example, the extraction and production of building materials. So one of the questions that uh, prompted this book was um, how do we, and, and here the, um, the clumsy we, refers to, let's say, Western architects or designers who benefit from a certain amount of uh, privilege. How do we begin to forswear our contributions to ecocide and decouple design potentials from ecologies of extraction, exploitation, and obsolescence, and from the imperative of economic growth? I use the term design potentials, working my way back towards the beginning of the subtitle, because I would claim that this is fundamentally what design uh, very, very broadly defined does. It potentializes objects towards one another, finding a language for their collaboration and interaction, be these objects human, animal, vegetal, or mineral. So potentials, the ability to do, or the ability to change, are not intrinsic 
to the objects themselves. For example, um, a pen can write, but always a function of encounters. The pen is not able to write in a vacuum, but only in relation to, um, let's say, an ink cartridge, a sheet of paper, a hand. So even if uh, philosopher Gilbert Ryle convincingly claims that, for example, glass can be brittle without ever being shivered, because it is, quote, bound or liable to being shivered when struck or strained, end quote, it is this being bound or liable to be in a particular state, what he calls dispositional properties, that defines the fundamental relationality of powers. And the phrase ecology of inception in the title of the book, which is also the central concept the book develops, maps and names precisely these relations, active or dormant as they may be, which orient objects towards one another and allow them to be understood together and to share common functions and scripts. From the Latin incipere, to begin, and capere, to be receptive, to grasp, to seize, it defines relationships that may set in motion or originate new performances, interactions, and functional sympathies. I should open here a parenthesis um, and mention that the Italian translation of Ecologies and Inception, I've recently had to translate this and I hadn't done it before, um, is not a literal Ecologia del Principio, but rather Ecologia dell'Utilizzo, Ecologies of Utilization. And, and here um, it's interesting that the Italian uniquely addresses the difference between the verbs use and utilize. The latter understood not in the English meaning of making effective use or using up, but following the, the etymology of the Greek root idzein, uh, meaning to make something useful. So in, in Italian, idzare at the end always, always is about turning something. So valorizzare is turning something into something valuable, utilizzare into something useful and so on. The diagram on uh, the left shows two ecologies of inception, A and B, which include a number of elements, for example, the various components in a bicycle or the ingredients in a pie, and the fact that the potentials of the bike or of the pie, for example, the ability to be ridden or the flavor or smell of the pie, are emergent. They don't depend on the single components, but on their ecological co-functioning and coordination. In addition, in capere, to capture in, to enclose, also alludes to the violence implicit in annexation, appropriation and inclusion. It suggests the drawing of boundaries and a compulsion to make things fit. So here, making useful or powerful is simultaneously a making useless or powerless of something else, of something other. So drawing the boundaries of an ecology of inception sets the parameters according to which items are included in, but also excluded from such an ecology. Therefore, in the diagram on the right, an ecology of inception becomes an engine for separating that which has value, which belongs on the inside, from that which has no value or deserves no consideration or attention, which remains on the outside. One useful aspect of this formulation is that while the boundaries of ecologies of inception define and delimit the scope of what can be viewed as useful or valuable, they also generate waste and construct disposability, both by excluding other external items and by rejecting internal ones when they fail to comply or perform. <laughs> 
So on one side, seeing design through the lens of ecologies of inception foregrounds its inherent violence. And on the other, it makes clear that specific roles and functions, as well as the values we associate with them, are fundamentally relational and therefore to a degree unstable, always capable of being otherwise, of unlocking different powers. And two examples of this are the rush hour rest stop designed by Ram Labour in Durban, South Africa, where scrapped car chassis become roofs and canopies. And on the right, the tiny accommodation Hortus Hermitage in the Netherlands, into which design collaborative refunk transformed a discarded grain silo. I'm particularly interested in, in this tension between a design or original sets of purposes and ecological scripts and secondary uses, misuses, reuses and diversions of all kinds. And the book is developed in conversation with a number of authors and concepts that contribute nuances to this tension. From Mary Douglas's work on purity to the practice of technological disobedience discussed by Ernesto Rosa in the context of Cuban design or the philosophy of the broken described by Alfred Sanretto in the context of Neapolitan technology, to Sarah Med's notion of queer use, uh, quote, used in ways other than for which uh, they were intended to be used, or by those other than for whom they were intended, and that second part is, is incredibly important, um, Giorgio Gambin's inoperativity, and Graham Harmon's dormant objects, just to mention a few. And this, I think, is one of my very favorite visual demonstrations or diversions. I, I might have um, shown this last year as well. Above fragments of wind turbines having been discarded and waiting to be covered up with soil in a landfill in Wyoming in the United States. And below the same family of decommissioned wind turbine parts is reinvented as a spatial language in the Vicado playground in Rotterdam, designed by SuperU Studios. And these spaces and affordances in the playground could not be imagined from scratch, from a tabula rasa, but as a result of a collaboration between the designers and pre-existing objects, the wind turbines in this case, that informs and steers the design process. And this conversation succeeds in opening up um, to novel uses and users. And many of the examples and case studies I discussed throughout the book are exemplary instances of this capacity to be otherwise. I try to use the two recurring terms that describe these changes, reuse and repurposing, with a degree of precision, they're not always afforded in the English language. Taking this largely from uh, the French difference between réemploi and détournement. So in the book, I use the term reuse to refer to ecological changes, so changes pertaining to the membership in ecologies of inception, that maintain the formal and functional orientation of an object as in the case of the windows and doors that are repaired, reconditioned, and moved elsewhere in the Sala Beckett project by Flores and Prats in Barcelona showed here. I use the term repurposing to denote ecological changes that largely maintain formal features, but divert them towards new functional orientations, as in the Lions Park playscape designed by Rural Studio in Greenboro, Alabama where galvanized drums, originally used to store mint oil, are turned into cylindrical floor, wall, and soffit elements, as well as um, into light wells. And finally, recycling um, destroys both the formal, let's say, macro properties of an object and its functional orientation. 
for instance, a tire that is um, shredded and turned into post-consumer tiles or wallets, or um, an aluminum window that is remelted into a billet and extruded into new forms. And what is critical here is the fact that the ability to recycle the entirety of an aluminum window frame, admirable as it may seem, still dissipates the 54 kilograms of minerals, 5 kilograms of chemicals, 70 kilograms of water, and 39 kilograms of fossil fuels required to manufacture it. It nullifies and makes vain the labor expended and damage, environmental and otherwise, caused in bringing the original object into existence. And furthermore, it sanctions the sustainability and desirability of the comparatively moderate damage inflicted by the secondary processing of scrap aluminum. Another important uh, difference, I think, has to do with whether reuse and repurposing occur within what I would call a material or a design context. And by this, I mean whether they pertain to the actual, let's say, mortar and bricks of a project, the materials out of which it is constructed, as in the examples in the previous slides, or to a project's overall setting. For example, the celebrated rehabilitation of a housing estate in Bordeaux by Anne Lacaton and Jean-Philippe Bassal, or the adapted grain silos in Heatherwick Studios site Smoka in Cape Town both of which require, uh, with different quantities, uh, the introduction of new materials. Therefore, we can use these four projects as exemplars of corresponding categories, material reuse, design reuse, material repurposing, and design repurposing. And obviously, these types of interventions can overlap and be combined, and there is um, and, and that can happen often, but, but there is value in being able to tell them apart um, and in knowing what we actually talk about when using these different terms. Now, taking a step back, um, my research started precisely by questioning the tabula rasa as the prevailing paradigm of modern design practice a tendency to begin from scratch and use raw, amorphous, and obedient materials or vacant plots that can be effectively manipulated or transformed, facilitating a seamless and faithful embodiment of intentions. The book argues that this approach can be traced back to Aristotle's theory of substance and to his so-called hylomorphism which on one side separates matter, filet, from form, morphe, and on the other associates them with potentiality and actuality, respectively. So according to this view, which is still remarkably commonsensical, on one side, a wet clump of clay a material is assumed to be malleable and capable of changing to many different shapes, and therefore rich in potentials. On the other, the fired clay figurine into which that material is formed is understood to be fixed, or in, in more kind of philosophical terms, individuated or actualized, and therefore incapable of changing. And of course, this inability or presumed inability to change or to contribute to other ecologies will often determine a loss in value, uh, and cause an object or component to cross ecological thresholds to be expelled and discarded. So the book aims to establish a theoretical framework for neutralizing the tabula rasa as a figure of potentiality, and more generally for reconsidering how design generates and maintains potentials in space and time. And in the second part of this talk, which, as I mentioned uh, before, cuts liberally across chapters, provide more of a general flavor um, than a precise argument, I will present some of the terms that steer and focus the book's discussion. Hylomorphism, 
circularity, exaptation, ecology of suspension, and at the end I return to the notion of ecology of exception. So starting from hylomorphism. Hylomorphism is in many ways the number one enemy of the book. And I demonstrate its fallacy following a number of different routes. One of them is to adopt a relational understanding of power, as I mentioned, which confuses a neat mapping of potentials to specific substrates, or rather shows that all objects are entitled to powers, and that a material state, or what Gilbert Simondon might call a metastable state, cannot be defined in advance, uh, in advance or be consigned to certain scales or chemical compositions, implicit structures, but is negotiated with and constructed by an equipmental ecology, uh, a referential ecology, which includes the building of skills, knowledges, tools, protocols, habits, etc. And this is where I like to think of architecture as omnivorous as capable of engaging with a materiality that goes beyond what an industrial capitalist economy can offer or articulate. And beyond the assumption that materials are known, given, and fixed categories, let's say timber, steel, copper, stone, etc. Many of the examples of this uh, uh, omnivorous approach are presented in the book. Uh, Again, an approach according to which unusual objects become construction materials. From the project developed um, by my students at the University of Edinburgh, mill cartons and plastic cores were churned uh, by Alana Cumming, Andrew Wyness and Kaya Hayes, and by Ryan Liu, Ivy Yan and Tenny Zhang into chairs and um, structural models. Another project by Mirte Timiadi, Sarah Kimali, and Renata Batabaye diverted jeans and large bales of discarded clothes on their way to the landfill or to recycling facilities in Asia, filled them with coffee grounds, and turned them into intrinsically human-scaled benches and partitions, while Cameron Angus, Jamie Begg, and Hannah Davis turned old car exhausts and metal scraps into furniture pieces. In yet another project by Mimi Hattori, Cindy Chananititham, and Rachel Long, human and dog hair are treated and combined with other fibers to develop felted architectural surfaces. And on the right-hand side, Tarula Bannerman, Molly Beasley, and Eddie Duffy assembled discarded hangers to form chairs and other structures. Now, what is notable about the studio are not only the final outputs or tectonic solutions that emerge from it, or the fact that design processes are fundamentally material-driven, and materials can no longer be decoupled from the situated ecologies that turn them into materials in the first place. But the fact that in order to source the necessary materials, students started to weave networks of collaboration, care and trust with the people working in local bars, hairdressers, bike shops, restaurants, cafes, etc. who are asked to go out of their way to set aside, collect or separate discarded materials for the students to pick up and to continue to do that weekly and over the course of um, several weeks. In addition, the work of preparation following these weekly collections of materials often involves washing and drying, repairing and mending practices. And this usefully reframes and reconfigures architectural design, questioning the presumed separation of intellectual versus manual labor, design, building and maintenance. And while these projects have, uh, of course, a very limited impact on <laughs> real world waste flows and on the reduction of actual material throughput, my hope is that they offer an ethical regrounding of design and materials, promoting environmental responsibility, not as a form of expertise that can be gained or not only, but also as a collective form of life, as a way of being in the world.
Another example of this approach, <laughs> sorry, hopefully my, my, my cough won't, won't um, start bothering me, um, is a recent collaboration with a few ex-students, Carlo Bannerman, Molly Deasley, Eli Duffy, Sarah Kimali, and Rana Tapatabaye, and Andrew Wyness, which curated the diversion of wire hangers, cartons, and secondhand jeans, and combined them into an installation and meeting point at Genova Design Week in Genova, Italy, um, this past May. Now, not only the installation does the installation show that when removed from a primary functional ecology, objects can perform in surprising ways. For instance, the flimsy dry cleaner's wire hanger can become a structural material. But also that when their meaning is understood to be contextual, the ability to shift set or the position within a set allows new potentials to emerge. In this case, for example, items are joined with rope or cable ties, so the connections can be undone and the objects can be recombined to perform other roles, from chair to beam to partition, uh, or as part of different modular units, or be returned to a primary ecology, the hangar at the laundromat. Now, the second key word I want to discuss is circularity. The notion of material circularity, to which I dedicate a chapter, um, seen from the perspective of technical nutrients, so the circulation of atoms and molecules, is one that for me not only perpetuates hylomorphism in its key assumption that only broken down, melted, ground, shredded matter, and not actualized objects can be repotentialized, but also takes a very simplistic view of the terms matter and form, assuming that they can be taken seriously, assuming a degree of objectivity and universality. And of course, there's a lot more to say about the circular economy to do with the viability of upcycling in the first place, with the environmental damage associate, associated with recycling and secondary production, with the fact that secondary production still contributes to constructing a desire for the material that increases demand and feeds more extractive processes and the primary production materials, with its inability to curb material throughput, with the fundamentally different philosophies underpinning shorter loops of repair, reuse and remanufacturing versus the circulation of molecules, with the amount of presumed control the circular economy often implies, with the fact that it is a fundamentally market-driven set of practices and value, as if that were all we could afford, etc. But the diagram on this page proposes what I call a nodal or exaptive economy. So, whereas a linear system of production transforms a matter input into a form output and eventually releases it as waste, matter and form, waste, M, F, W on the drawing, a circular mode of production links the first and last steps, matter and waste, and thus turns the latter into the input for a new productive cycle or ecology, matter, form, waste, matter, etc. Yet in both cases, the potentials required to fuel an individuating operation rely on the potentializing force of a matter input and assume both matter and form to be objective things in the world. So timber and a table, clay and a brick. Instead, a nodal approach does not follow Aristotle in coupling matter with potentiality and form with actuality, but understands matter and form to be roles that any object can, in principle, perform, switches that can be relationally and contextually turned on or off. So, for example, to the lumberjack, the tree is raw matter and the log is formed matter. To the sawyer, the log is raw matter, and the board is formed matter. To the carpenter, the board is raw matter, and the chair is formed matter, and so on. 
So matter and forms are the roles performed during processes of actualization, during operations such as logging, sewing, and woodworking. And in this context, a tabula rasa, a condition of original formlessness, is unattainable. And the stipulation of more or less form is never given objective or neutral, but renegotiated by crossing ecological and sub-ecological thresholds. So always contextual. We use the term acceptation and accepted design because they help us move away from the standard language of circularity and force us to reconsider these practices from a different point of view. It's a term borrowed from evolutionary morphology, first coined by Stephen Jay Gould and Elizabeth Ra in the 1982 essay, Exaptation, a missing term in the science of form. The thesis Gould and Ra put forward is that adaptation as an evolutionary mechanism conflates historical genesis, so features built by natural selection for the role they perform, and present utility features enhancing current fitness. In other words, they confuse the emergence of form and how forms are actually used. Darwin already noticed that evolutionary mechanisms exceeded a linear adaptive trajectory. Writing about the infused sutures in the skulls of young mammals, Darwin remarks that while this feature might indeed be indispensable for parturition, it can also be observed in the skulls of oviparous animals such as birds and reptiles, and is therefore not, strictly speaking, an adaptation. And of course, we're aware of uh, vestigial structures in our own bodies, structures that index preceding evolutionary steps, but have lost all utility in the present configuration of our organisms, for instance, the appendix or tonsils. Other examples include the evolution of birds, feathers evolved for thermoregulation rather than flight, and the internal supportive skeleton of animals, which started out as a storage of calcium phosphates for metabolic processes and not for the development of bones. So Gudenbra proposed <laughs> Excuse me. To return the language of evolutionary, evolutionary biology, differentiating between the three terms you see on the screen. But the term aptation, they refer generically to the acquisition of fitness. By the term adaptation, ad aptus, towards a fit, they indicate features built by natural selection for their current role. And by the term exaptation, which is the one I'm interested in here, they describe features built for another use or for no use whatsoever, and later co-opted by reason of their form, ex aptus. Now, what is remarkable about this retune terminology is that form is no longer necessarily tethered to a function, but can exist in a state of suspension that does not preclude the possibility of new uses or values emerging in the future. And so if the first part of the book is driven by an exploration of ecologies of inception, again, as teleological enclosures, as the naming and constructing of purposeful interactions between objects and parts, the second part of the book reclaims a potentializing role for other ecologies, what I call ecologies of suspension. They negotiate a measure of worth in suspension, in the lack of productive relation. There is already a key element of non-relationality or suspension in Aristotle's notion of impotentiality. The fact that the only reason why the ability to play the piano does not result in my constantly playing, playing the piano is that it is accompanied by the ability to not play the piano, to withhold action. So, so the two are already um, part of one another in many ways. 
But one further shift here is the one suggested by Alexander of Ephrodisias from a tabula rasa to a rasura tabula, from powers that derive from a lack of pre-existing content. So we can write because the tablet has been scraped clean and can receive new messages to powers that are inherent in the malleability and plasticity of the tablet's wax surface. And one of the ways I try to think through this question in the book is the notion of medium, as opposed to format or message applied to objects. So in the same way that a piano is playable, as opposed to just played, because the keys once pressed will return to an unpressed and potentially pressable state. So can objects, for instance, a chair or, or a building component, become playable and be allowed to fluctuate between uses and states? For example, between primary and secondary functions or as elements that can be assembled or disassembled. And this is, of course, quite a different understanding of potentiality, which is affirmed in excess of use values, functional scripts, and molecular obedience, and in defiance of established measurement and justification protocols. So ecologies of suspension are deployed to think through and negotiate the gaps between ecologies of inception, facilitating transfers and exchanges, for instance, the migration of materials and components, the peeling off of ecological layers, establishing localized temporalities, for example, the slowness of acts of deconstruction, repair and reconditioning, as opposed to the careless speed of the wrecking ball, and preserving a stock of existing and therefore co-optable parts. And the images on these pages um, represent this peeling of layers. For example, when a part which has been subsumed and fixed into a hole, the tile in a floor, which in the picture on the left is being dismantled by Rotor in the Institute of Modern Engineering in Liege, can renounce its floorness and retrieve its tileness. And this shift allows it to regain value and to be moved to a different ecology or building. And finally, through the shift from a tabula rasa to a rasura tabula, through Timothy Morton's idea of hyperobjects, objects that are massively distributed in time and space, and through an archaeological understanding of materials, which Jane Hutton um, beautifully calls fragments of other landscapes. Towards the end of the book, I revise a simple teleological understanding of ecologies of inception, seeing them not only as synchronous cross sections of collaborating constellations of elements or parts, typically within the scope of a project, but also longitudinally, longitudinally and diachronically, so across time. In other words, there are forms of ecological continuity and identity between, say, the mining of graphite ore and a pencil, at least because it is in the former, it is the former that makes the latter possible. So even if the two ecologies would appear to be completely detached and to lack any coordination, we can begin to understand them as sub-ecologies within a single larger ecology, one that is longer and distributed in time and space. And this is what um, the drawing on uh, the left tries to represent. On one side, this fuses designed objects with their political and environmental effects, and on the other, re-internalizing what economists call externalities. It prompts us to rediscover value in the energy, carbon, labor, and environmental damage embodied in objects, and in intergenerational collaboration, rather than in novelty, authorial signatures, or individual projects.
So in conclusion, the book argues that in order to address the climate emergency, the design disciplines must become able to articulate value as existing beyond commodities and cultural archives and beyond the projects and outputs of any one generation or author. Thank you very much.